Okay, good, good morning everyone and welcome uh, to the eighth meeting of the Local Government Communities Committee. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones as the meeting papers are provided in digital format tablets may be used as try that again, that tablet devices may be used by members during the meeting. That, that's really a polite way of saying, you see us using our phones and our, our, our iPads or whatever, we're, we're looking at uh, briefing papers uh, uh, for, for the committee. Uh, we've not received any apologies, we've got a full house again today, which is good to see. And uh, we move to agenda item one, which is decision on taking business in private. The committee is invited to consider whether to take item nine, consideration of its draft report on the council tax substitution of prop Proportion, Scotland Order 2016 in private. Are we all agreed? Okay, thank you. And we now move to agenda item two, Local Government Boundary Commission for Scotland's fifth electoral review. The committee will take evidence in the Local Government Boundary Commission for Scotland's fifth electoral review and the Scottish Government's subsequent response from a panel of witnesses, followed by the Minister for Parliament, Parliamentary Business thereafter. This session follows on from the last meeting where we heard from the Local Government Boundary Commission for Scotland on their review themselves. So we move to panel one. And this morning I would like to welcome Charles Repke, Head of Governance and Law at Island Butte Council, Paul Vaughan, Head of Community and Corporate Development, Fife Council, Kate Gallagher Swan, Campaigns Organiser, Electoral Reform Society, and Councillor David O'Neill, President of COSLA. You're all very welcome. And I believe a couple of you have got some brief opening statements to make before we head to questions. Uh, Kate, maybe take, take you first. Aye, no problem. Yeah, okay. um, first of all, thank you very much for having me. My name is Katie Gallagher Swan. I'm a Campaigns Organiser for the Electoral Reform Society. Um, we had three specific things we wanted to point out in response uh, to the Scottish Government's response to the Boundary Commission. But first of all, I think it's important for us to discuss or at least lay some of our opinions out um, about the context in which we are um, given these comments. Um, there exists a democratic deficit at a local level in Scotland. And so to comment on moving boundaries seems like it's just scratching the surface of the necessary, necessary reforms we need in local government. This sort of uh, tinkering um, of the reforms was sort of revealed um, in the Commission's recommendations through a few tensions that, that we felt were present. Um, because the Commission was of course necessarily constrained by the outdated legislation from 1973. For example, a focus on decrease in representation in rural areas and outlining the comparisons of representativeness between rural areas and urban areas. Um, and the decreasing of the rural areas, which in our opinion goes against most evidence in the necessary reforms that we need at a local level um, in, in Scotland's local democracy. The second thing that we would like to point out is a specific problem with electoral parity. Despite being the Electoral Reform Society, we think that focusing a priority on electoral parity is also outdated. Um, we have a parliament that wants to see communities run by them rather than for them, but the prioritisation of electoral parity is in direct tension with this philosophy, and we would like to see more emphasis on recognising communities as units of decision-making. Lastly, we'd like to raise a concern about the process specifically. It's been mentioned before in this committee, but it is important for us to recognise again that while we sympathise with the decision that politicians made in rejecting certain recommendations from the Boundary Commission, the fact that the rejection happened with an independent commission is something that has to be recognised and the reasons for it, which may again point to necessary reforms and the systemic problems facing Scotland's local democracy. Thank you very much, Katie. Um, Councillor Rio. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, Chair, can I uh, start by saying that here in Scotland, we are out of step internationally in terms of local representation and, and local democracy. Uh, it is important to remind the, the committee that COSLA's ambitions go well beyond the, the current work of, of the Boundary uh, Commission. We have a much bigger vision to create a stronger local democracy in Scotland, which is more local, more empowered and more representative and also more, and this is a hard word to say, participative. Uh, both representation and participation are the two sides of the same same coin. We had the, the Independent Commission on Strengthening Local Democracy and we found that for its size, Scotland is almost unique in the low number of uh, local authorities that cover very large populations in geographic areas. 
the ratio of citizens to local elected members in Scotland is approximately 4,500 uh, per councillor. In England, it's 1 to 3,000. In Germany, it's 1 to 400. Uh, and if you go to Sweden, it's 1 to, to 150. European uh, local authorities cover an average 20,000 people. Uh, here in Scotland, the average is 165,000. In Denmark, which has got the same population in Scotland, has got 98 municipalities in uh, five regions. Here in Scotland, we've got uh, Highland Council, which is uh, the same size as Belgium geographically, uh, but Belgium's got over uh, 500 councils at the, at the level closest to, to the community. Uh, so local democracy uh, isn't particularly healthy here in Scotland. I mean, we, we pride ourselves in being democratic, but if democracy is reduced to going and putting your cross or your number on a ballot paper, once every, it turns out, about 12 months now, it, it's more or less a, an annual event. If that's what democracy is all about, then we're not doing it very well. If we're going to be serious about participative democracy, we need to do it differently. So our ambitions go way beyond the work of the Boundary Commission. Thank you very much, Councillor Neil. We'll, we'll move to, to questions now, and we'll pick up on lots <coughs> of those points made in those, those introductory statements. Um, and can I ask Ruth McGuire for the, to come into the first question? Thanks, Convener. Um, good morning, panel. Um, I asked the, um, the, the panel at our last session about the 10% the cap on changes. Um, the answer given was around minimising disruption to the electorate, um, although the phrase getting to whole numbers was, was also mentioned. I'd be interested to hear the panel's reflections on that restriction on changes. And I think, you, I mean, you already spoke about, you know, reducing councillor numbers as... Um, being problematic rather than rather than helpful. Okay, so in relation to methodology used and that, that artificial, if you like, 10%, mm -hmm. I want to come in on that. Councillor O'Neill? It certainly is an artificial uh, figure to say that you can't move more than 10% in either direction. It means that you ignore uh, good, solid evidence which would uh, lead you to move uh, in another direction. I will use one local authority that I know particularly well, uh, my own, North Ayrshire. North Ayrshire currently has 30 elected members. Its population would justify it having 36 elected, elected members. But because of the, the restraints or constraints put on by the, the Boundary Commission, they will not move more than 10% in either, either direction. North Ayrshire, uh, in common with lots of local authorities, is working very hard at locality planning, aligning with other public agencies how we do locality planning. And the irony is that the only part of the public sector that's not going to be aligned to locality planning is the elected members because of the artificial constraints placed there by the Boundary Commission. Okay, I don't think anyone else wants to come in on that particular point. Uh, other witnesses desperately trying not to make eye contact with me there. Uh, Ruth, do you want to come back in? No, maybe later. That's on that. It might be an opportunity, um, whether Councillor Neil or any of our other witnesses, to say a little bit more. I mean, I used the expression artificial to, to kind of illustrate the point uh, Ruth McGovern was making about that 10% variation and change. Is there anything else you feel we might have been a bit too rigid or too artificial about the methodology used that you might want to put on the record here today? Yes, From our, our Gallant Butte Council's Ritchie. point of view, uh, we believe that our islands and our unique geography, the sparsity of our population, should have uh, allowed us to retain our councillor numbers, which was eventually the decision of Scottish Ministers. We made a number of arguments in the written submissions that the committee have about why that was important in terms of a number of our councillors have wards where they have to travel with ferries or even planes to get between one part of their ward and the other. Uh, and we felt that there was a need for there to be enough flexibility for the Boundary Commission to reflect that. We made submissions around that in terms of departing from party, but because of the preeminence of party and their considerations, we weren't successful in that argument until the Scottish Minister's decision. So, so we certainly feel that uh, there should be more flexibility to recognise these unique geographical situations, particularly with island communities where the island councils have that benefit, but Argyll and Butte Council didn't get the benefit for its islands, if you like. 
Thanks, thank you very much. I'll take Mr Vaughan first, then I'll take Councillor O'Neill in. Yeah. I think in the, in the submissions that um, Fife presented, uh, there was probably three points that um, we, we had in terms of the, the methodology. One was around the actual use of the index multiple deprivation as, as a proxy for workload, and uh, you know, the committee have looked at that. Um, I think also um, the use of the 3,000 um, figure in terms of the, the population, and you looking at that from an, an urban rural split, um, was to, to us seemed somewhat arbitrary, um, given the different scales and sizes um, of, of local authorities. And the third thing was really just in terms of the impact that it had on mixed urban rural um, uh, authorities like Fife, uh, where we have such a, a wide variation in terms of very small villages up to you know, fairly sizable towns. And the, the way that the, um, the boundaries are then uh, constructed didn't really lend itself to actually recognising that split, uh, that mixed geography. And I think it maybe picks up something that Katie said, just about the, the, the difficulty that um, the, the, current, um, the current methodology has in terms of actually recognising urban rural um, splits. Okay, that's helpful. And I know members will want to come back and talk both about island communities and deprivation factors uh, as we explore questioning further. Uh, Councillor Neil, you wanted to come in? Uh, again, using my own personal experience, uh, Ruth will understand what, what I'm about to say since Ruth used to represent the same ward as, as I do. I can stand in the centre of my ward and walk 15 minutes in any direction and I will get to the boundary of, of the ward. There are other local representatives, the length and breadth of Scotland, who couldn't drive 15 hours and get for one for the centre of their, their, their ward to, to the boundary. We've already had, uh, heard the experiences of people having to use ferries, etc., to move from area to area. Why do we insist on having a system which is a one-size-fits-all? You can either have three-member wards or four-member wards anywhere in Scotland. The Islands Bill is currently looking, as I understand it, and having smaller numbers for, for the islands, uh, as in the Western Isles, uh, Orkney and, and Shetland. But in my own council area, half the land mass of North Ayrshire is the island of Arran. The mainland has a population of 135,000. Arran has a population of 5,000. Why can't we have a single member ward for the island of Arran? The legislation doesn't allow it. Why do we have one size fits all? Rurality is important. Now, I'm going to take Mr Gibson in just a second. There's a more general point about... Um, sorry, Katie, I'll take you in first, actually. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no problem. Um, again, I want to highlight the point that, um, from the Electoral Reform Society's point of view, about electoral parity. Um, we understand that the legislation prioritises electoral parity, and we think that that's outdated. Um, if we want communities to be run by them, then we need to have a way of emphasising the importance of communities as units of decision-making. Now, there's a spectrum that goes from mathematically seeing um, elections as boundaries that are technocratically decided via electoral parity, and at the other end of that spectrum is seeing communities on par with one another. Somewhere in the middle, because of the diversity of Scotland, as has been outlined by um, my other witnesses, <laughs> we need to find something that works for Scotland. And that's not a, Scot that's not a one size fits all, but that works for the diversity and the different sorts of communities that we have in Scotland, because the borders isn't Glasgow, isn't Lewis. Okay, that's helpful. And it means I'm now not going to ask my supplementary question, so we'll take Mr Gibson now. Thanks very much. And of course, Island of Arran is in my own uh, Cunningham North constituency, and I did ask questions about the single member uh, for uh, Arran. I mean, frankly, um, um, my view is we should go back to first past the post for local authority elections. I say that as a person who originally moved the STVB, our party policy, some 20 years ago, but I think 10 years of experience tells me uh, it wasn't the right thing to do. But, but in terms of uh, um, uh, Argyll and Butte, first I want to ask, um, you, you say in, in your executive summary in Annex B, you say um, uh, there's a risk of the impact of new ward arrangements in attracting a diverse range of councils. Now, I think that's an issue across Scotland, I have to say, given the low remuneration relative to the burden that councils actually have. I just wonder if you can talk about what issues that has created in Argyll and Butte in terms of being able to attract people, not just, you know, like... Um, pensioners, for example, to stand, but folk of working age who may actually have a strong contribution to make, but for economic and family and other reasons are unable to do so, given the structures we have at present. Yes, no, thanks for that. I think uh, <coughs> the 
the view of the Argyll <coughs> Council is that uh, we have our meetings held mainly at Kilmory. We have area committees that meet in, in regional centres, but we have our, most of our committee meetings at Kilmory. That can mean an overnight stay for somebody just to attend a two-hour meeting if they live on the island of Isla. Uh, if you don't drive, you, your public transport links are very poor, so uh, you can have a difficulty getting to meetings. I know some councillors who have to find a lift with another councillor to get to the meeting, even just travelling 20 miles, because there aren't the infrastructure links that fit in with the timetable for meetings. And I think if you're looking at standing for the council, people who live in Argyll and Butte are very familiar with the council. The council is the biggest employer in the, in, in the area, apart from the MOD. And so people are familiar with the council, they know how it works, and they're aware of how it does its business at the moment in terms of its meetings at Lock Hill Ped. They happen during the day. All of these things, I think, can present a barrier to people who have childcare issues who, or who have other issues about transport mobility and and that, I think, must be a barrier. Uh, I don't have any empirical evidence for that, to be honest with you, but it's a view that we have from councillors who have difficulty travelling at the moment. Uh, and it hasn't stopped them standing, but it does create barriers for them. And sometimes we have to uh, you know, find special arrangements to get them home at night if a meeting runs on. So those are the kind of challenges that face the existing cohort of councillors. We've recognised that in terms of the induction materials we're putting forward for uh, the, the, you know, the forthcoming elections next year and trying to encourage a more diverse group of people to come forward. And the council is currently reflecting its political management arrangements to try and uh, consider uh, what changes it might make to make it more user-friendly, I guess, and, and that's currently ongoing at the moment. And how, how concerned are do you feel um, in terms of the issue of parity? Because, you know, as, as the Electoral Reform Society says in its submission, Orkney's only 813 electors per, an average per ward. Yes. And you're expected to have significantly more than that in Argyll and Butte, which must really make it difficult in terms of the size of some of the wards geographically. Yes, some of the wards are, are very large. And as I said already, you could have to, some councillors regularly take planes to travel from Oban to Tyree or Call to do surgeries. Uh, many councillors use ferries to get from their home to council meetings or to visit constituents. Uh, and so I think it is a, a big issue for us in terms of the, the, the workload is there uh, uh, and, and it's spread out. Uh, and although there is, you know, with the advent of new technology, that helps people, but there's still a very large set centre of population of, or group of population who still want to meet councillors face to face and to deal with them on the doorstep. Our councillors are very visible in their communities. If you're in your local supermarket, your local hotel, Everybody knows who their councillor is and you're never off duty. That's what the councillors tell me. That's my experience. I've seen it myself. And so they are constantly at work because they are never far away from their communities. And even although it may be a spread out community, the councillors that we have, many of them serve for a long time and they're very well known across the large constituency. That they have. I know that feels good. Just ask one further <laughs> question, Community. It's on the issue of parity. And I, yes. <clears throat> you know, and I can understand the frustration. Uh, and David O'Neill obviously talked about the answer situation too. But... The other, the other side of the coin is that, for example, um, if, if you didn't have parity, you could have a situation whereby you have one ward, um, which is, say, 3,000 electors, and, a, and another um, uh, three wards with 1,000 each. Now, when it comes to the make-up of the council, that means the votes, effectively, of the smaller wards, sorry, the wards with only 1,000 members, are three times more valuable at the council, and that could create a disproportionate... Um, you, you could change the proportion of the council and therefore obviously influence where the council devotes its resources, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So, for example, in Arran, although it's only got 3% of the population in North Ayrshire, half the landmass, the island, I'm sure, would like to have one multi-member ward, but it then could have 10% of the, of the council with only 3% of the population and therefore would have more influence perhaps in other areas. How do you square that circle? Yeah, I think that's a very difficult one. I'm, because that's I, yeah. why parity is in, in here. Yes, and I, I, I'm a lawyer by profession, so I understand uh, you know, the, this legislative background. I've worked as an elected and administrator, senior deputy returning officer for the last 20 years or so. So I recognise that, and, and in some respects, uh, I have a sympathy for the view that parity is an important consideration. Uh, I'm also aware that politically, the council's view was that, that parity didn't achieve what we wanted, and we were looking for a departure from parity on special reasons. 
But my personal view is that, that, that you have to take some account of party because of the reasons you've outlined. And I, I know that some other witnesses have a different view, uh, and, and I can understand that view as well. But simply, with my background as an electoral administrator, I feel more comfortable uh, in terms of recognising the, the benefits of party, although we thought in our Gallen Butte Council we had made a significant argument to depart from it. So I want to have my cake and eat it, as you can see. <laughs> All of us do, uh, including all 32 <laughs> local authorities. But Councillor O'Neill, um, you know, you take a broader view. Yeah, with, my, with my, my colleague is a lawyer by profession. I'm a blethern by profession. Uh, parity uh, is important because we concentrate on representative democracy. We need to concentrate on both sides of the coin, including participative democracy. They are both equally important. And that means that we will Place, we should be placing more emphasis on the participation with people being involved in the budgetary process, people being involved in the decision-making pro process, and they should be involved at the community that's important to them, not an artificial community that's drawn up by someone sitting in an office uh, in Edinburgh, Glasgow, or elsewhere, or indeed in the council, council headquarters. Uh, again, I will use North Ayrshire as an example, 130,000 of our population, no one lives in North Ayrshire. Not a single person lives in North Ayrshire. They live in Irvine, they live in Brodick, they live in Salkitts. That's the place that means something to them, not the artificial boundaries that we have. Thank you. Now, I'll wait to Mr Whiteman in a second, but just as we mop up some supplementaries in relation to this, the theme's very much been on how the methodology does or doesn't take into account rurality or island communities and participative democracy. So I'd be quite keen to mop up some additional questions in relation to that if there are any before we move to kind of wider supplementaries. Okay. Yes, of course, Mr. Short. Thank you, convener. Can I just have a view from the panel on their, on, on their own view with the checks and balances that have been put in place by uh, the, the Boundary Commission themselves when we look at the whole urban rurality issue? And also, you know, we find at every local government election, turnout is an issue. And that has to have something to do with the size, the dimensions of a boundary, the locations of a ward, uh, because there's not the same engagement uh, between uh, the public uh, and uh, the candidates uh, or the election. Uh, and, and, and what does the panel feel about that? Because, in my opinion, has be, as being a serving councillor for the last 17, 18 years, uh, the, the links are getting worse and worse and becoming more and more uh, unapparent uh, as you move forward. Anyone want to comment on that? Councillor Neil. Uh, many, many reasons uh, for that. The the size of wards is, is part of it. Uh, the ability of local members to influence what what actually happens. Uh, we've seen nine years of a, a council tax freeze. Where, uh, that's getting replaced with a cap uh, been placed placed upon it. I can't go to my electorate and say, do you want me to spend more money on uh, certain projects? Because central government, the Scottish government, don't allow that level of flexibility. Therefore, people come to the conclusion, you know, there's no really much point going out and voting uh, for the council because they kind of really influence what happens. So we need to get local democracy back into the heart of our communities, get participation and real decision making back to the local level. Okay, now a supplementary speech. So Katie, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, Sorry, just yes. to echo um, what David was saying there, I think... Uh, yeah, those things definitely do impact voter turnout. Um, but as David said, there are a plethora of other things. Um, he outlines participation, and I agree completely, but also giving real power to local communities to be able to make decisions and do things in their communities for their communities, I think would make people, <laughs> would encourage more people to actually engage in the local democracy, because at the moment, I think that there's a great lack. This might be a good opportunity to put on the record on behalf of the committee that at next week's committee meeting we're actually having a round table uh, with the theme being how we increase participation and in voter turnout in local government elections. So it's something that the committee is conscious of and something we're keen to play our part in helping to uh, improve that situation. And I'm sure anyone kind of following this committee will want to 
want to see that, that evidence session next week, or perhaps even if they have suggestions, even at this late stage, time is short, perhaps uh, drop us an email and we can raise those questions and discuss them at next week's meeting. A couple of supplementaries in relation to that. Um, I'll take Elaine Smith and Andy Whiteman. <coughs> Thanks very much, Convener. Just in listening to the evidence, it, and, and thank you all for coming to give evidence this morning, it, it seems to me that um, we're going a bit beyond the, the boundaries of a boundary review. And just, um, I was listening to my colleague Kenneth Gibson and what he said earlier about the, the actual changes to local government. And as one of the members of this parliament who voted to retain, one of the few members who voted at the time to retain first past the post and actually did so on the grounds of local democracy and accountability in smaller areas, I just wondered whether any of the panel um, would, like, would, would like to comment on whether or not we should be looking at that legislation, uh, post-legislative scrutiny, if you like, of the whole legislation that changed the whole system of local government and representation. Should we be taking a bigger look at that rather than um, just, like, obviously, this morning we're just simply talking about the Boundary Commission and what the recommendations are from that? Any takers on that? Katie? Oh, sorry, David. <laughs> um, I think that... The conversation around against STV is blaming STV for problems, wider problems in local democracy that are not the, the, the voting system. Um, we have issues of voter turnout, we have issues of representativeness, like David outlined earlier in the international comparisons, we are very, a very underrepresented country at the local level. Um, the issue is not necessarily with SDV or the voting system, but with the wider reforms that need to happen. Um, I completely agree that the boundaries of this discussion on the Boundary Commission are, are becoming more expansive, but that's because the, the situation is serious about local democracy. And unless we take that into account in any conversation about changes to boundaries, um, then it isn't being as fully fleshed out as it can be. Um, and we're not taking the opportunity to have that discussion. The vision has to be big for how we want to improve participation and improve our local democracy. And unless we bring up these things in this arena, then where else can we? Thank you, Katie. Councillor Reel. Could I perhaps pose it as a question? Why do we have a one-size-fits-all approach to diverse communities across Scotland? Why does it have to be STV, multi-member wards everywhere? Why can't we, for example, it might work well in the city of Edinburgh to have multi-member wards, but it doesn't work in Argyll and Butte, it maybe doesn't work in Highland. Why do we need one system? Does anyone else want to come in on, on that? Okay. Can, can I just check then, Councillor, does that refer back to your initial point about um, the I use the word artificial, it must be a three or a four member ward. Uh, I mean, I, I, I would keep multi member wards and single transferable vote, but you, as you said, there could be a two member ward or you could use STV with a single person to be elected. Is it back to that flexibility of approach in relation to the, the size and the amount of elected representatives per council ward? You, you could use a plethora of systems if that suited local areas. You could amend single transferable vote to have single member wards still getting elected with 50 plus, uh, plus one of, of the, the votes, votes cast. So there's a variety of different ways, but my basic point is, why do we have to do it the same everywhere? Thank you. Uh, before I take Andy Whiteman, any other witnesses want to add anything to that? Mr Whiteman. Uh, thank you, convener. Thank you for coming along today. Um, obviously, we're looking at the Boundary Commission, and what's been interesting in this work is the tension, if you like, between having a, a system that um, is relatively objective and minimises the extent of political interference into setting boundaries and councillor numbers and all the rest of it, which is obviously has dangers to it, but at the same time allowing for the kind of flexibility that reflects that, that um, recognises that Glasgow is very different from Argyll and Butte. And I think what's clear from this evidence is that this, this is a conversation that's will continue. I think what's clear from this morning as well, um, from what you've uh, said, is that looking at boundaries and councillor numbers and parity and all the rest of it is just one part of a, very, a bigger discussion about electoral systems, about things like councillor remuneration uh, and all the rest of it, which itself is part of a bigger conversation about the future of local democracy, which you have talked about this morning. So, I mean, my question is, um, is it time, obviously, the evidence we've heard suggests that changes are required in how we arrive at 
uh, boundaries and councillor numbers um, in terms of timings of reviews, criteria that are to be used, <coughs> flexibility or whatever. And we will consider and report on that in due course. But is it time in this parliament for a more fundamental reform of the whole system of local democracy? Because as you point out, some of these things are intimately linked with other aspects of our local democracy that um, you know, we can't consider in isolation within a review of how the Boundary Commission discharges its functions. Councillor Neil, yes. Uh, I have been having discussions with the Scottish Government about legislation that's currently going through uh, the Islands Bill, for example. Uh, I asked uh, again at the COSLA conference uh, of Derek, uh, Derek Mackay as to whether uh, the Government or indeed any of the political parties uh, would uh, promote a bill of permissiveness to allow uh, local communities, local authorities, public agencies to work in ways that are different from what, what we currently currently do. Uh, I will just pluck this as, a, as an example uh, out, out of the air. Again, uh, the islands, the three island councils uh, have at various times over the years talked about a single public agency for the islands. If Take Orkney, if you had the local authority, the health board, the local enterprise company, all working as one, would that not make, make sense? Uh, it might be good that uh, you could do something like that in, uh, in the islands. It might be that you would want the cities through the city regions to be working closer with other public agencies. To get that type of change to take place now, the legislative process would be torturous. Let's get a bill which gives permission, allows that to happen, where there's local desire and, uh, and local request for it to happen. I also want to come in relation to, to that. Do you want to add anything to that, Mr. Whiteman? Uh, no, I was just, I was just, um, I mean, reflecting on the on the evidence you've given this morning. Um, to get some idea of uh, your level of ambition for this parliament in this wider arena um, at this early stage. I mean, we, we can go through the next five years doing little inquiries and boundary commissions and council remuneration and various other modest things, but there's also the opportunity to do something rather more fundamental. Point out um, to all, anyone watching that the evidence session is on local government boundary commission and their process and the methodology and how that fits into <laughs> local democracy. But I think Mr White's made, made a general appeal. If you want to contact us about what you would like the committee to look at, please do that. We're always willing to listen to ideas. Indeed, we've already met with some of you to discuss what, how, how that could happen. But I think that's reasonable to say, Mr, Mr. Whiteman. Uh, can, can I maybe actually reframe the question that, that Andy did actually ask? Because uh, the, the government is looking at reforming community planning partnerships. It's looking at extending participatory uh, budgeting. Um, it's got the community empowerment agenda. And we're looking at a better way of the process by which we agree local government boundaries. And I know there is going to be an elections bill. We'll last this to the minister when it appears before us a bit later. There's going to be an elections bill at some point in the future in the lifetime of this parliament. I don't know what's going to be in it. But, you know, that, that's a theme to hook something onto, I suppose, Councillor O'Neill in relation to maybe not all the ambitions that you have, but tweaking some of those processes to better represent communities, both in terms of parity where it's achievable, but also to identifiable communities and have them more involved. So if you want to make any comments on how local government boundaries could hook into some of that, that might be an appropriate thing to do that we could then take up with the minister. But I thought it was important to, to put that on the record if anyone wanted to add to that or make a comment, uh, Mr Vaughan. If I can make a comment on that, the, I mean, the, the, the crucial part for us in terms of the, the response that we gave was about how it related to local community planning. Um, Fife is set up with seven area committees. Those area committees were made up from amalgamations of the multi-member wards. So um, for us, it was quite critical that the wards in any changes that are actually made um, allow us to continue the work that's been going on over the last number of years in terms of working at a partnership level at a, a, a recognisable, as far as we can, local communities, given, given the, that electoral structure. So I think in terms of anything that goes forward, in terms of that, it's, it's actually crucial that we actually join up that community empowerment part 
the community participation part um, alongside what's actually going on in terms of the, the representative um, democracy part. It's, it's actually um, a clear way that we feel that we can make a difference and are making differences to local communities through uh, that local community planning um, approach. And is that something you're keen to be constructive in relation to working in partnership with local government, even though clearly you're disappointed with what the outcome has been in relation to Fife Council, would you be keen to work with government to improve that in the future? Yes, I think so. I think, I think we still find the examples of um, different parts of government not always but talking um, the same language in terms of what we're trying to do in terms of community empowerment um, and, 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 and in terms of that community participation. I think that goes right across all the different public services that are actually being um, delivered in a local area. Um, I think it's important that I think local people tell us this, that um, they, they want to see um, a way of actually engaging with us that allows them to actually um, make, the, make the changes, allows for variation in, in what's actually going on in their local communities that better suits that. And there's a lot of work, I think, that we do trying to um, maintain um, those arrangements which are over and above anything to do with representative democracy. Okay, thank you, Mr. Vaughan. Uh, Mr. Simpson wants to come in in relation to that? Yep. Um, thanks, convener. The, there's a couple of areas I want to explore. Um, so if we take the, the first one, because there might be some questions on this. The use of deprivation uh, as a factor in determining councillor numbers. This seems to have come from left field uh, for a number of councils. In fact, we had evidence from East Renfrewshire and East Lothian uh, complaining about uh, how it came rather late in the day, uh, the change in methodology. I just wonder what your views are uh, on the lateness uh, and the use of deprivation. Any takers on, on that? Councillor Ariel. I, I know that Ronnie's sitting behind me. I, wish, I think he wishes he'd never heard the word deprivation. <laughs> uh, it did come late. Uh, like all politicians, I get gut feelings for things. But when I get a gut feeling, I then go and look for evidence to either prove or disprove uh, what it is. There was no evidence for deprivation to be, be included. There was no work done. There was no, no study done to see, see whether uh, that, that was what, what it, was, it was all about. Uh, there, there have also been artificial barriers put in place. We talked about, about some of them, them earlier. But I think it is important to say that local government as a, as a whole do not object to the proposals because they don't like them per se. It's because the methodology that, that was used just went wasn't right. If we are going to uh, put different factors into it, there needs to be an understanding of how those factors are, uh, are being decided, and that didn't happen in this instance. I think, to be fair to, to the Boundary Commission, I think that they now understand that uh, and have uh, indicated that they would like earlier engagement next time around. Thank you, Councillor. Anyone else want to add anything to that, uh, Mr Vaughan? broadly agree that um, we didn't really understand um, the relevance of um, the deprivation um, figure to councillor workload as it was actually portrayed. Uh, and I think some of the evidence that we've presented sort of showed that it, it, it was a sort of somewhat arbitrary, especially using of the 15% the um, figure as well, um, didn't really help. Um, and there's a final thing, which is really that the, the SIMD is, um, is a geographical um, representation um, of, of deprivation and doesn't really get to people. Um, and a lot of work has to be done to it to actually get to the point that you actually understand um, the deprivation that individuals and families are actually um, encountering rather than the, the, the geographies that are actually there. And some of the work that we've done since the, the latest release of, of the SIMD would sort of again indicate that the, the SIMD is not a great proxy um, for that. I think the final thing I would want to add is that we did, um, we, we were told that a study was actually being undertaken um, of council workload to see if, if, what, what um, evidence could be um, found, but I think we still have never actually seen that final report, and I think it would still be useful to actually see that. Can I just check whether witnesses agree that deprivation should be a, a factor or a key factor? I mean, I, I would make the point that um, slightly tangential, but bringing it back, back, back to the deprivation factor, that one of the things MSPs get is they get employees that maybe work for other MSPs in different parts of the country, they come to work for you, and they get a very good 
uh, take on the type of casework you get and how busy your office is based on, if you like, the the, the type of area that, that, that you represent. And I have to say, Mary Hill Springburn has significant deprivation. And I've had individuals tell me that they, they didn't realise just the significant casework that there would be uh, compared to other, other, other parts of the country. Um, so I, mean, I, I would strongly say, and there's rural deprivation as well that has to be identified within those formulas also, but would anyone argue that deprivation shouldn't be a factor? I would argue that we should do a study to see whether it is a factor and to see what other factors there are, what factors there are in stopping people, and we did touch on some of them earlier, wanting to be local elected representatives, what stops women from wanting to be local elected representatives. 25% of the uh, councillors in Scotland are, are female. We are very lucky to get young people. Local government is more and more dominated by white, middle-aged men, me, you know, and, uh, and folk, folk of... of, of not, well, of not, not, yes. <laughs> well, if only that was so, you know, it would be nice, it would be nice. But there, there's lots of things that we should be looking at. We have very uh, we have small pockets of deprivation within the larger sort of data sets that can't easily be seen, and, and that would be masked, I think, in terms of some of the work that's done. You know, and, and our councillors are familiar with these areas, uh, and they can be very small indeed, but nevertheless they can be important. My own impression is that, that a councillor's workload isn't just directed by deprivation. You know, a lot of work will be around planning matters and and, uh, and things like that that are becoming more and more contentious. Uh, and so I think that, that uh, the study that's suggested is, is the way forward to try it. And we need to factor in rurality when the data sets are at such a level, how you drill down to pick out those pockets of deprivation within a larger area that doesn't present in that way in the stats. Helpful. So it's not rejecting it. It's getting a, a better and more clearer evidence-based understanding <coughs> of the demands it places on elected representatives and, and feeding that into the methodology. But we've spoken a lot today about... Uh, the methodology, but there's also the process, and I'm conscious we've got Mr Ripke in front of us, but eventually at the end of the process you got, within the structures we have, if you like, Argyll and Butte got satisfaction, that, if that's the correct word to use in terms of outcome, but Mr Vaughan and Fife didn't get satisfaction. Now, if there wasn't a ministerial, or if there wasn't a check and balance in the system, then neither of you would have had satisfaction in relation to a uh, lo local government boundary commission proposal. So I'm, I'm hoping, well, I'm not hoping, I I'm, I'm keen to find out whether you believe there should be a check and balance in the system. That statutory check and balance sits at a ministerial level at the moment. Um, we'd be keen to know what that check and balance should look like if it didn't sit at a ministerial level uh, and whether that should move away from politicians or whether it should be given Parliament greater scrutiny. We're wrestling with some of these things within within the process as a committee as well. So any comments you would like to, to make in relation to that would be quite helpful, I think, for the committee. Again, about Council's point of view, I think we are of the view that the Scottish Minister's involvement was important for us because it got us a satisfaction, as you've outlined. I think it was important in terms of the, of the campaign that was mounted, that it was a cross-party campaign and it was also community-driven by... None of our communities were in favour of the proposals that were coming forward. So I would have thought that that gave the, the Scottish Minister some comfort that the decision that was being asked for was not one to try and benefit one party. It was a genuine response from communities about their concern that the new structures would break up communities and divide communities uh, that had a, a, you know, a particular focus that had been developed. So, so I believe there should be a check and balance, and, and I did think that it, we felt it was important to present a cross-party approach because we felt that took the politics out of it and left it back at a community level, saying this is what the community is looking for, the status quo. So we'll take Mr Vaughan in a second, but it's worth pointing out, I didn't ask the question to uh, work out whether Argyll and Butte had a stronger or weaker argument no, no. than in Fife. No. It was about the process behind mm. it and whether there should be a check and balance in the system. If there is a check and balance in the system, you won't always be satisfied with the outcome. And clearly, no. Mr Vaughan and Fife was not satisfied with the outcome. So 
I appreciate you'll now want to see it a little bit in relation to the five situation, given Mr Ripke's comments, but it's more about whether you agree there should be a check and balance in the system and where that should sit. I, th I think that there needs to be a clear, um, it needs to be clear who's taking the final decision um, in terms of what those boundaries are. Um, the process uh, for us, um, while um, we would have preferred at least no change, um, uh, if, if not actually the, the, the changes in uh, population leading to more councillors, um, the actual process um, we felt this time was uh, probably significantly improved from what had happened previously. I think the, there was more transparency, certainly, um, in our discussions with um, the Commission um, and the officials at the Commission in terms of the approach that they were taking and um, the engagement that we had with them um, in terms of when we realised that we weren't necessarily going to um, maintain the councillor numbers in terms of the actual geographies um, was actually quite um, it was, was, was quite a, a good process from our, our idea. But I think that also was down to the fact that we spent an awful lot of time um, as a council um, working with councillors, getting their views um, on what the changes should be um, with a fairly clear um, set of guidance from them in terms of trying to maintain um, that local community planning and our local area uh, committee um, approach um, when we were actually looking at the, the, the boundaries that initially were presented to us, so much so that the ones that we then fed, or the changes that we fed back were the ones that were finally d done on the public consultation. Um, but I think, as, as you say, I mean, we would have still preferred that um, we hadn't really had to go through um, those changes um, at all. Okay, and uh, Casey? Yeah, uh, put simply, yes, we think that there should be checks and balances. Um, and while on this instance, we sympathise um, with the reasons uh, the five recommendations were rejected out of the 30, um, we still think that that should trigger a concern. Um, and specifically looking at why, um, the re why the recommendations were rejected. Um, and in this case, um, from our perspective, it's because the 1973 legislation um, does not work um, in, in, in the guidelines. Um, one size does not fit all, and so undertaking the same process for 32 local authorities, which are not, in fact, local, um, is more important um, than considering the checks and balances of the, the process specifically. OK, but is it not um, reasonable to, to contend that um, there's no point in having checks and balances in the system <coughs> if they're never, ever exercised. Um, so they've been exercised in this case, they haven't previously been exercised, so that, that's got heightened public attention because, because th 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 those statutory powers have been exercised. Now, when we had the, the Local Government Boundary Commission in front of us, I asked the question, do they think they get things right all the time and there shouldn't be a review process? And they said, well, that's for others to decide. Now, I don't think any politician around this table would say they always get things right and the check and balance that we have is, is an election every four or five years. Um, so what's on the table is the current statutory process. So do you agree that the current statutory process should be exercised if the minister feels it's appropriate, but you contend that the statutory process should change? And if it should change, what should that look like? Well, in this instance, if the ministers had not rejected it, we'd be losing 10 councillors in the islands. Um, I think that that, uh, as, a, as an outcome, um, would be much worse than bringing up the question of why is it that we are getting to a juncture where the recommendation is being rejected. Um, I think it, the checks and balances sh should be respected, but in this instance, um, while we agree with the ministers, it poses a problem for the independence of a commission and the confidence in the system. Yeah, I'll, 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 yeah but uh, Ms. Councillor O'Neill has still got the opportunity to speak, and I'm still following a line of questioning. I'll, I'll let you in in a second. Um, uh, yeah. I, I, I'll leave that sitting, but I find it confusing to say that there should be a check and balance in the system, and of <laughs> course it should be exercised, but you're concerned because it has been exercised. And there seems to be a conflict there that perhaps as a committee and as, 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 as a, in partnership with the government and others, we have to explore some of that. But I don't know if you want to clarify that or we'll just maybe bring Councillor O'Neill in. Yeah, uh, yeah. 
just to, just to quickly clarify, perhaps the tension is becoming because in this instance we agree with the ministers right. and that it should be rejected. Um, but it does pose a concern to the robustness um, of, of these checks and balances. Um, however, and, and I think that in this instance it should trigger why the rejection happened. The rejection happened because it doesn't, the, the, the reg, rules and regulations and the methodologies used did not work for all the communities mm. in Scotland and we should be looking at why they didn't work. That's really helpful. That was my lack of understanding in your last answer. Thank no you worries. for clarifying that, Councillor O'Neill. Not liking the outcome isn't the same thing as questioning the methodology. You can be unhappy with, with what's decided. You can be unhappy with how it, it, it was decided. Uh, should there be checks and balances? Absolutely. Uh, and my own personal view is that the more independent uh, that the, the Commission is, that would be, be better than having politicians, whether they are local or national. And now you could argue that in this instance, the uh, the input for the minister in some instances was helpful, in other instances was, was, was not helpful. But the perception from the public, as soon as politicians get in, into the role of deciding what happens to politicians, you know, that just seems a, a bit of fish to, to me. That's a personal view. Mm. So how, how would you improve the process, Councillor O'Neill? Uh, there needs to be... Uh, much more discussion on how the methodology is, is worked out. And again, a personal point, point of view, I would uh, prefer a commission to be more independent uh, and less uh, subject to direction from ministers. That's a personal point of view. But still with a check and balance yes. contained within it? Right. Yes. Okay, but what that looks like, we have to explore yes. further. Okay, a um, couple of supplementaries. Uh, Mr Whiteman and Mr Gibson. Yes, thanks. This is getting on to the substance of this. Um, there's a difference between checks and balances and um, the final decision maker. I mean, the minister is exercising a, a role of a final decision maker as to whether to accept any of the recommendations or not. And within that role can provide checks and balances, but also potentially within that role can do other things. Um, so I'm just wondering, I mean, A, do you think this system needs to be reformed? That's a simple question. And secondly, one type of reform might be to follow David O'Neill's um, argument that the process is objective, it is independent, but that the criteria that are used to arrive at boundaries and council numbers and all the rest of it can be more geographically sensitive. So the same criteria do not, do not need to be used in different parts of Scotland and that further than that, the councils themselves should have some independent role in um, adjudicating on those kind of criteria so that it's satisfied that the process that's been going through will deliver for it, but doesn't have you know, the power to make those decisions, but is satisfied so that it buys into the process at the beginning. And therefore, even if it is unhappy with the outcome, it realises that actually, you know, that the process has worked well for them, for Argyll and Butte, for Aberdeen, or whatever. So my first question, does the system need to change? And secondly, is that one way in which it might be improved? And you probably got one cut at this because of time constraints. So if you want to answer both of those questions, now's your time to do it. So are local politicians better at interfering with an independent process than national politicians? Um, Councillor O'Neill. Uh, <laughs> short answer to, to Andy's question is yes, yes. Uh, I, I mean, the way that Andy summed it up, I, I, I would be hard pushed to find him to, to disagree with uh, in, in Andy's summation. Uh, Katie. Yep, uh, it is an independent commission, and thusly we should respect its, object, its objectivity. Um, however, that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be a check and balance, and whether we want to leave that in the hands of politicians. Um, I think that's to be discussed. Absolutely. Uh, so just uh, count, uh, sorry, sorry Councillor Vaughan. No, no, Councillor no, 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 I want... Uh, through the chair, no, please, Councilor. Mr Whiteman. Uh, no, Mr. Mr Vaughan. <laughs> um, I mean, all systems can be improved. I mean, there's, there's no way that, 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 that we couldn't actually look at something that was better. And um, I think much more transparency in terms of criteria um, that are being used and, the, and in the methodology um, is, is, is actually crucial um, in terms of just having um, confidence in, in the approach. And Mr Repke? I think if, it, if it's not a one-size-fits-all, I think it's a difficult task to work out what that new 
arrangement would look like. So I, I do think that it's difficult to be clear on, on uh, I think if you have criteria that's going to suit geography of Argyll and Butte, how you match that up for other areas, I'm not sure. So uh, I think it's a difficult question about how you come up with a solution that fits all of Scotland. Uh, and, the, and so the devil for me would be in the detail of what came forward if it was to try and address our concerns about geography uh, and, and what that meant in terms of the impact on electoral participation if people saw that as a plus or a minus, I guess. You know? And time constraints means, Mr Whiteman, apologies, I can't let you back in for two other MSPs wishing to make a comment in relation to this line of questioning, Mr Gibson. Yeah, just very briefly. The convener, I mean, if, in 3.8 three, three of your submission, Mr Ripke said throughout the consultation phases, the council was consistently clearing its objection and opposition to the changes proposed by the LGBC, but they didn't seem to listen. I mean, we, they're an independent body, but what do we do if that independent body simply doesn't listen when you've got cross-party support? I mean, there's an issue there about should it be, you know, uh, uh, local councils or should it be uh, national politicians, but surely East Lothian is another example example, where you have uh, all the politicians and, in fact, everybody else all singing from one hymn sheet, but the local boundary commission is quite is simply ignoring them, then that uh, indicates a clear flaw in the system and uh, there should be much more uh, flexibility in, in being able to address that before going to ministerial level. Yes, I, I think that uh, I recognise the role of the boundary commission and the fact that they had to fit within the rules they had, had uh, set. And, and we recognised, I guess, that our case, when it, when it didn't succeed with the Boundary Commission, had to be made to the Minister. And, and, and I suppose my take on it was that the Minister had a discretion to look beyond the criteria that the Boundary Commission were looking at and to recognise the strength of local feeling and the community feeling about that. And that they had that discretion. And that's why I, I would be in favour of retaining the checks and balances. I think there has to be a transparency of how that is operated and what the reasons are for that. Because if the reasons aren't transparent, then there is the possibility of people regarding it as some sort of political fit up or whatever. So I think it was a, I thought we made a good case to the Boundary Commission, but I understand the reasons why they didn't choose to follow that. And, and that's why the Council adopted the approach it did in taking forward its argument. Thanks. Okay. Um, Graham Simpson. House Convener. <clears throat> yeah, this was actually the second area I wanted to explore. Um, we, time is really against us, so I understand that. I understand, that. Question I, I understand that, and you've you, you've covered uh, a lot of ground, asked a lot of the questions that I would I would have asked. You also um, took I just want to. When you, 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 you also took Elaine Smith, the deputy convener's question, earlier on, but you can ask your question. Do you now. want me to ask a question? Go go do it now, please. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, would you remove politicians uh, from the end of the process altogether? looking for a purely objective uh, methodology, then that would seem like the appropriate outcome. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment on that? Remember that's local politicians as well, gentlemen? I think that there is scope for discussion in just how you do that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm really looking that, forward. That's a maybe's eye, maybe's no. I'm really looking forward to these last two answers. M Mr. Vaughan, please give us an answer to this one. Uh, no, I, I have to, I, I, it, again, it's just, I think it's one of these things that needs to be um, examined more fully. And Mr. Ripke. Uh, I'm an officer of the council and uh, <laughs> I work closely with politicians all the time, so I see the benefit in having a political check and balance in, in areas of uh, governance. Uh, on, on that note, um, I, I think we will end the evidence session there. Um, can I thank everyone for, for, for giving evidence? I suspect this is something that our local government committees have looked at irrespective of the outcome of the local government boundary review, because there's wider issues there that have clearly been at play for a number of years, irrespective of these, these current decisions. And thank you very much for... Uh, uh, giving evidence th th this morning. Uh, can we suspend briefly whilst we change uh, witnesses? Thank you.
Okay, um, we continue now with our evidence in relation to the Local Government Boundary Commission for Scotland's fifth electoral review. And we move to our second panel. And can I welcome Joe Fitzpatrick, Minister for Parliamentary Business. Good morning. Brian Peedy, Relationship Manager, Local Government Policy and Relationships Unit. Uh, good morning. And Tony Romain, Senior Policy Officer, Local Government Policy and Relationships Unit, Scottish Government. Um, you're all very welcome this morning. And can invite uh, the Minister to make some opening remarks. Yeah, uh, very briefly, but th uh, thanks very much. Uh, to the committee for the opportunity to explain our approach um, for the decisions we took on the fifth review and to answer any questions that members might have. Um, I know the committee have already taken evidence from the Local Government Boundary Commission for Scotland about the review. The commission is an independent body, so it's not for me to comment on the detail of how the commission went about its work and produced its recommendations. What I can do is describe how and why we took our decisions on those recommendations. So my starting point in considering the Fifth Review's recommendations was that the Commission is an independent expert body and had produced its recommendations after extensive discussion and consultation. So therefore, there would have to be a very strong reasons for not accepting those recommendations. But at the same time, Parliament has given Ministers the responsibility to decide whether or not to accept the recommendations. That being so, it was both right and necessary that I should consider the recommendations for each area and decide in each case whether or not to recommend them. And that is what I did. In doing so, I took into account the representations from councils and other stakeholders, both on the Commission's proposals as they were uh, developed and on the final recommendations after they were submitted to ministers. I also took into account the likely impact of the Islands Bill announced by the First Minister in the Programme for Government, and crucially, we had to consider the implications of not implementing any of the recommendations, for example, on parity between wards within a particular council area. So I hope that's a, a helpful um, overview of um, the, the process that I went through, and of course I'm happy to answer any questions members have um, going forward. That's a very bright... Okay. Thank you very much, Minister. I'm going to take other members in a second. Just very briefly, can I start where we ended off the last evidence session, and that is the statutory process itself, where uh, yourself as Minister for Parliamentary Business have the statutory duty to be the check and balance within the system and effectively, as was mentioned earlier on, the final decision maker with, within, within the system. Uh, first of all, do you believe that there should be a check and balance in the system and what's your thoughts <coughs> on where that final decision should sit within the process? Well, clear, clearly um, it's for me to work within the parameters that Parliament has previously agreed. Um, I think the decision that it's a, a ministerial responsibility would have been stemmed back to 1970... 1973 is the basis of the current legislation. Nine, back to 1973. Um, the Parliament then would have looked at the whole arrangements for local um, government elections back in uh, 2004. Um, and on, on that occasion, obviously the Parliament, I was not here, um, must have felt that the <coughs> arrangements whereby the um, independent uh, commission carry out the review and ministers are then given the responsibility to either, and duty in fact, to um, agree or disagree um, was satisfactory. So I've, I've had to work within the arrangements, but of course that would be something that's for the, for the Parliament to, to look into whether that would be appropriate going forward. Now, I asked at last week's, uh, or the last meeting of this committee, to the Local Government uh, Boundary Commission for Scotland whether or not they thought that they always got their decisions right and whether there should be a check and balance in the system. And they kind of helpfully said that's for others to decide. Um, so do you think they always get their decisions right? Well, well clearly, um, the Commission, I think, have done a very um, good job. They've worked very hard to listen to communities up and down Scotland. Um, we can see, um, if, if, if you look at the, the, the reports that they produced, the, the engagement they had with communities, the way they'd managed to make um, changes to initial proposals to take account of stakeholders, councils, community councils and others' concerns going forward. Um, but clearly, in spite of that, with the restrictions that the Commission have, there were five areas where I, I, I felt that, well, they'd done, I think, as good a job as they could with the constraints that they had in terms of their statutory duties and the legislation, that I, I felt it was better not to approve those recommendations. So it's not that I'm saying that anybody gets anything wrong. It's, it's that when you look at the specific 
um, instances, I had to make a decision. It was my responsibility to decide whether to implement those recommendations or not. And Minister, that, that statutory power has never been used before, um, is, is my understanding, in the lifetime of this Parliament in relation to that statutory duty. Do th I think I would disagree there. Um, uh, in 2006, the then um, Minister in charge of, of, of boundaries would have made a decision and he will have made a decision on each of the local authority boundaries to either agree or disagree. As it happened, he agreed on all occasions, but nonetheless, I'm quite sure that the, knowing the, the minister as, as he was, that he will have taken his responsibility as seriously as I did and will have made his deliberation on each individual council area. You've, even though I, I phrased my question in, uh, clumsily, which is that the the power exists and the duty has been exercised, but changes were, were, were agreed. Um, you've got every confidence that previous ministers will have taken their responsibilities very seriously, because it could be argued if you get a check and balance in the system and no organisation or individual will always get everything right, and that check and balance is never exercised in terms of blocking those changes that perhaps previous ministers were or timid or didn't want to be seen to get involved I, in the process? I, 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 I do not believe that the minister in question um, that, that would be true. I mean, I, th I think the, the other difference, I suppose, in 2004 was that there had to be the boundary changes, and so the option to reject um, would not have been possible because we were moving from single member wards to SDV. So that, that would be the difference. But I'm absolutely certain that the, the minister in question will have taken. Um, will have looked at every um, proposal very carefully before um, he agreed. Final question before I take Mr White, but I just noted that I'm going, going to take you in next. Um, you said it's for Parliament to decide whether or not the current process with yourself or the Minister for Parliamentary Business has been the final decision maker. It was one for Parliament to, to, to have a look at and examine. What's your, your view in relation to that? And just as significantly, are you, is the Scottish Government up to have a review of that process um, to see if there's a way to, to improve um, the, the mechanisms by which a final decision is made? I think it's, it's always appropriate that we review our processes. I mean, as I say, it was, um, the, the decision in terms of the process for final ministerial um, approval um, well predates um, my being an MSP. Um, and we, we do have, we have indicated that there'll be an elections bill coming forward. So these are things that we can look at in the round to see whether our arrangements are, are still appropriate uh, going, going forward. Um, but obviously for this process, um, we, we have to follow the legislation as it stands. I'm pretty clear that there'll be, there will be some areas who are, are very grateful for the fact that I did have the ministerial um, ability to reject some of the decisions. Um, I'm, I'm sure there are that now. Take us maybe some of the details of, of that, Mr Whiteman. This, this gets to the nub of the question because you, you, you mentioned and commended the Boundary Commission for its work and its independence and all the rest of it. But the evidence we've heard is that people were not satisfied, um, not just with the outcomes, but they, 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 they analysed that their lack of satisfaction with the outcome was in relationship to the methodology that was adopted. Mm -hmm. Um, and you, as a final decision maker, as I understand, under Section 17 of the 1973 Act, the Secretary of State may, if he thinks fit by order, give effect to any proposals made to him by the Boundary Commission, either as submitted to him or with modifications. You have, uh, your officials will correct me if that's not the substantive um, legislative basis of your powers, but you have very, very, very wide latitude to do nothing or something. As you correctly pointed out the last time this was done, effect had to be given in order to introduce a new electoral system. But, you know, 1973 was a Westminster government. There was no Scottish Parliament. Mm -hmm. You as a minister are accountable to a democratically elected parliament. Um, we have a new electoral system that's been in place now for over a decade. Um, as a politician interested in good governance and having heard some of the evidence and hopefully sort of read some of the evidence about the, the dissatisfaction that people have with the process, mm -hmm. is it not... Wouldn't, do you not have the view that um, your very, very wide powers of, powers of decision-making in the final instance, although exercised in this instance, I think, to the satisfaction of some of those in, in whose interest you exercised it, is perhaps not appropriate because the system seems to have some defects? I, I think um, 
it's kind of two separate questions. I, you know, I think whether it, it's, it's best that there's a final oversight um, of, of the recommendations of the independent commission or not is, a, is, is, is one matter. But the idea as, as to whether the, the, the system could be improved, I, I think we should always look at systems and, and processes. So, I mean, could it be that they do, there might have been some sort of process prior? <coughs> You know, when, the, when the Commission was setting out their methodology, could there have been a parliamentary process at that stage? Probably. I don't think there would be anything that would have stopped um, Parliament asking the Commission to come in and explain their methodology. And, you know, it's never happened before, so it's probably why it didn't happen. But you know, maybe that's something that would be flagged up in the future to make sure that... Because it's always better if you're making changes that there's buy-in to the methodology before any decisions um, are, are made. And it's much more difficult when you see what that methodology means for a particular area and um, to, to then say, well, that's, that's, not, that's not good because I don't like the outcome. So it's better if we can get people bought in at the start. So I think that's something that might be worth investigating. Very, very brief follow-up on a, a, a separate issue to do with timing because one of the concerns is that the decision you made um, has come at uh, quite close to the next elections and given the complexities of parties selecting candidates in multi-member wards. It's not quite as easy, and my party in particular has quite complex processes and gender balancing and all the rest of it. We have to start quite early. Um, do you think we could improve the timing of this process so that people standing for election have a little bit more time to know the circumstances in which they will be standing? I, 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 th I think so, and I think um, colleagues will correct me if I'm wrong. When the timescale was originally in, envisaged, um, the elections would have happened before. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, the elections would have happened a year earlier, so we'd be doing it after the election. Yeah. So the, there has obviously been a... We've, we changed the, the, the period of election for local government um, to, to five years because of changes at Westminster um, in the last parliament. So that... that so, so, so you it, it would always be better if it's not as close. That, yeah. that said, um, that, that was, you know, once the Commission had... Um, made the recommendations as a period of time that I had to wait, and that would have taken us into recess. Um, yeah. But I, th I think the good practice is six months before, so we're, we're ahead of that. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Simpson. Um, thanks for attending, uh, all, all of you. Um, I'm interested, uh, Minister, what you were saying about the, the, the methodology, and uh, you hinted that you thought that MSPs, Parliament, um, should perhaps have some role in, in setting the methodology, the criteria for any independent commission. Um, and following on from what the convener was asking, um, I wonder if, if you could just be clear on whether you think there should be a, a political role at the end of the process, as, which, which you, you clearly are able to exercise at the moment. Should that change? So, in terms of um, a, a role for the Parliament, I think it's very important that the Commission remains entirely independent, but I don't think that would stop um, probably this committee asking the Commission to come and explain and discuss their, their methodology. I would have thought the Commission would probably find that helpful as well um, going forward, but I, you know, I do think that the Commission have to be entirely independent. The question as to whether there is um, a role um, at the end for a ministerial decision, clearly for the Scottish Parliament boundaries, there is not. Um, so, uh, you, know, you know, it's, um, it's, it's a balancing act. Yeah. As I say, if, if I didn't have the, the responsibility to, to make the decisions that I did, then um, the five areas which I did not accept the recommendations would have been less happy. And so, I guess in those cases, people would, are, are grateful that I did have that power. But... It is for Parliament to decide, and um, prior, both, although it was, the legislation was set in, in um, 1974, um, it, you know, this legislation was looked at again by the Parliament in, in 2004, uh -huh. so you know, Parliament must have been satisfied that it was appropriate that this was someplace where there should be um, ministerial oversight. I mean, do, do, do you think there's merit in Parliament looking at it again? Because as, as, as you rightly point out, uh, Ministers... Uh, don't have a final say on, on Scottish Parliament boundaries, but you do in local government. I, 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 th I think it's a reasonable, reasonable thing for us to continue to look at our processes and our ways forward. Um, and, you know, I, th I think that, that's perfectly appropriate for, for that to be looked at as to whether people think that is appropriate or not. Yeah. Um, it was quite a heavy responsibility that I, I bore. Um, and, 
over the, the, the summer recess um, because I knew that in, in each of the cases, each of the councils, the representations that I received were, were deeply felt in, in each case. So I, I took them all very seriously and, and spent a great deal of time making sure I understood um, the, the concerns that people had with recommendations and, and what communication there had been with the Commission. That's interesting. Um, can I just ask one more on the methodology? Um, you're right, the Commission is independent, but would it be right for somebody else, well, let's say politicians, to set the methodology that they use and then leave them to get on with it? The, the, the Commission will, will um, follow whatever rules are, are laid down. So if they, they're, they're, they're going to do their work based on statute. Um, so if, if there's a feeling that there should be um, changes to that, then, then they would do follow that. And in this case, yeah. they have followed the, the, the regulations to the letter um, to come up with, with their methodology. But ultimately, it is yeah. their methodology, and they are an independent body. Um, this is the first time in 20 years that councillor numbers have been looked at um, across Scotland. That didn't happen in, to any great extent previously. Um, so clearly, they had to look at that their, me their methodology for that, and, and uh, you know, it is a, ma a matter for them as an independent body what that methodology was. Okay, Mr. Gibson. Uh, thank you very much. So, I mean, the evidence we heard from the previous panel was quite clearly and distinctly that the methodology is far too rigid um, on council numbers, a plus or minus 10 per cent. It doesn't necessarily take into local account, into account um, particular uh, circumstances. The issue of parity is clearly a blunt instrument, particularly where STV wards cover huge geographic uh, areas and island communities. And also we, we heard um, perhaps that why do we have to have the same system in all parts of Scotland? Because the system, for example, of STV might not apply particularly well in rural areas. Um, uh, compared to urban, one of the reasons being the difficulty in attracting um, people who want to actually stand and be councillors, given the pitiful uh, levels of remuneration if you're going to do the job effectively. So I'm just wondering what the Scottish Government is going to do to try and take these concerns and issues on board so that the next time we have uh, a review, uh, it will be uh, much more um, uh, acceptable, uh, I think, across the board. I, two things. For, first of all, a um, major piece of work um, that we've announced is the, the Islands Bill, which will have significant implications, and, mm -hmm. and that was the reason which I felt it was not appropriate to approve changes to the, the, the whole island authorities, because clearly the Islands Bill could potentially have significant impacts on the entire authority. Um, the Islands Bill will potentially have impact on, on other, author, other authorities as well, so um, North Ayrshire in terms of, of Arran. Um, as, as one example, mm -hmm. um, and the, the, there will be examples in Argyll as well, where the, the, um, the um, Islands Bill may have implications. Obviously, I wouldn't want to preempt the Parliament's um, scrutiny of, of that legislation, but potentially that legislation would allow single or two-member wards where in, in, in populated island, island communities. And so that, that will help. That will give the, the Commission some flexibility. Clearly, there are... Um, other areas in, in um, mainland Scotland where, again, we, we need to, I think, look to see what further flexibility we can give to the Boundary Commission so that they can protect communities, because that was the one thing communities wanting to stay um, as, a, as a cohesive unit was, was the over, overarching, although there were a few occasions where communities were saying, no, we don't want to be one community, we want to be two communities, so that we have more councillors covering X town. And so it, just I think, I think um, Mr O'Neill um, did say in, in the last session um, that, he, that we shouldn't have a one-size-fits-all yeah. approach enough, and I think that, that's true. I think we should look at how we can make this system. We've now had STV in place for a number of years, so I think it's appropriate that we should look at how we can make that system. I 100% agree with STV as, as being the best system um, to provide democracy, but I think we do need to look at how that can, can better represent um, local communities going forward. Thanks. It certainly isn't in terms of accountability, but in, in terms of uh, the minimum disruption to uh, uh, voters, um, uh, when I asked the Local Government Boundary Commission questions on this last time, saying that the, you know, in, in my own constituency there are communities that are uh, you know, a 40 minute drive apart from each other, and the answer really was, well, that was a mistake made 10 years ago by the previous commission, and we've just effectively went along with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, surely we have to get back to uh, first principles on, uh, on that. So, and the only other question I would ask, uh, convener, is. In an area where there is cross-party agreement, 
that the local government boundary commissions are simply wrong. East Lothian, for example. Surely the minister should really take on board those local concerns. If there is no opposition to what, um, to, to, uh, um, to what the local authority collectively is saying, i.e. all the parties are agreed, communities are agreed, then surely the minister should go along with that rather than accepting a local government proposal that clearly goes against the grain uh, mm. across, across the board. So, so talking in, in general terms, um, when I looked at um, correspondence to the Commission and to myself, um, I did also look at what changes the Commission had made, so whether the Commission had managed to, to make some concessions towards mm -hmm. um, uh, state particular uh, councils, um, and, and also I had to look at what impact that would have on parity. So, for instance, in, in um, <coughs> East Lothian, I think it would have been a 16% under-representation for Musselburgh had I not... Um, accepted the recommendations and that, that's you know that, that that's a, a significant within one council area for an area to be underrepresented by that, that that's you know that 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 I felt was beyond but, but, but their con part. concern is that they're losing two councillors when they, they feel they should have at least the same or more surely and East Renfrewshire is in a similar person. position yeah. so so East, East Lothian was one of the councils where the commission did listen to the representations and their their initial proposal was to reduce the council number by two um, the Commission heard, heard the, 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 um, the comments from the Council and adapted their proposals to just reduce it by one. So, um, you know, while they, in terms of the methodology being straightforward, they should have reduced that Council's um, number by two. They listened to representations they'd received and came back with a proposal which reduced it by just one. So I thought I think it's an example that the Commission was, was listening and engaging and, and trying to respond as best they could going forward. Back in later. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Alexander Stewart, followed by Ruth McGuire. Uh, thank you, Convener, uh, Minister. Some of the proposals that we had in, in front of uh, us and yourselves had some had very little or no response from communities and councils. Uh, others that were much more volatile had massive uh, response by, by communities, you know, hundreds turning up to public meetings, etc., uh, to express their view and opinion. Uh, and, and you've touched on your, your, your outlook on one size fits all on, or not, as the case may be. Uh, and we've touched on in this forum before about the low turnout that sometimes happens at, at local government elections. Uh, we, we understand the criteria the Commission used, but it would be quite useful to get a flavour of the criteria that you used in trying to balance that uh, and square some of these circles that you had had to deal with, uh, because as I say, you know, there were some that were quite clear cut, and other ones that were really very controversial. Yeah, I, I mean, there was no question that there was different levels of engagement in the process um, ac across Scotland, um, and and that I certainly took that into account when I was I was going through. So I didn't just look at the representations that I received as as minister, which um, I I received. Um, representations from a number of, of areas, um, from MSPs, um, from councils and from some individuals. Um, but I also looked at the representations that the Commission had received during their process. You're right to say that in some areas there was very little engagement and that might be something that the Commission wants to look at as, as to how, how that could be made more engaging because I think if people feel ownership of, of the process then they're maybe more likely to take part in, in the election that then comes and that I think we all want higher turnouts. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that, that, that's something that they, they would want to, to, to look at going forward, is how to, how to engage people through the whole process a bit yeah. better. Okay. Do you want to add anything to that, Alexandra? No, I'm, I'm, I'm content. I'm content at the moment, Convener. Okay, Ruth McGuire. Okay, thank you, Convener. Minister, um, looking at the five local authority areas where um, the changes were um, rejected, what representation did the Scottish Government receive from them? And was there anything different in the representations that they made that, that meant their requests were successful? Obviously, I had to look at the, 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 the whole breadth of evidence in, in, in each area. And in the, in the two island areas, I didn't accept. It was a specific request because of the Islands Bill that was coming that came from the Islands Authorities. And, and you know, I, I felt that was appropriate. In the case of Argyll, um, Dundee and... Um, uh, the borders, um, there was significant concern about changes to historic local communities, which was clearly um, 
very significant um, in terms of what was being done and, and the Commission had not managed, whereas in other areas the Commission had managed to make changes to the initial proposals, the constraints that are placed on the Commission in terms of legislation meant that they were not able to, to um, accommodate those, um, those concerns um, in, in the other three authorities. Um, just a, a quick follow-up. With those five, did they reflect um, greater kind of public participation in the in the, the submissions and in the... There, there were significant um, significant um, representations from the public in all, all three, yeah. <coughs> from the public, from cross-party politicians, um, council. So it, 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 was, it was of a different scale. OK. That's what's now. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Elaine Smith. Thanks very much, uh, and thanks for joining us, Minister. Um, just following on from that, though, I think uh, in the evidence we got from Ms Lothian, they, they tell us that there was, um, was a lot of public engagement, councillor engagement with their case. And what they say specifically in the evidence is that um, you yourself, Minister, gave no indication as to what the repercussions of not accepting the Commission's recommendation for East Lothian might be. They feel that, given that you had rejected several of the Commission's recommendations, then the, the argument that the review had to have a consistent approach across the whole of Scotland actually fell. And, and clearly they feel that if, um, if you could reject some of the Commission's recommendations for one or more council areas, then you could have actually rejected it for other council areas, I mean specifically theirs, because that's the case they are making. So I just wondered if th there was anything um, you felt you could add to what the repercussions might be of not accepting the committee's recommendations for East Lothian? I, th I think I need to be slightly careful about what I say in specific in terms of East, East Lothian, given that I understand that they have um, decided that they may want to take legal action. So I think I would, I would need to be um, careful um, of, of what I say. But in general terms, um, across all councils, I looked at the representations I had. I looked at the implications for communities of um, accepting recommendations. So, for instance, one of the things I was looking for um, was were there uh, community council areas that were being divided? Um, and, and that was something that I put a, a degree of weight on if, if, if that was there. Um, and crucially, I also had to look at um, the, the implications of not, um, not uh, implementing the recommendations based on parity and in the case of Musselburgh in particular it would have been a 16 per cent under representation from the citizens of that of that of that town so that, that that's that's a that's a, a, a huge disparity within a council area so it would mean that some councillors would some some people would have less representation than others by a by a big chunk Okay, if, if I could just then, um, I've got another couple of areas that I would like to explore. If we could go back to the methodology, um, the, the deprivation factors seem to have made a late entry to the process, and I wondered if you could give us any comment on that. Um, as, as I think I've said it previously, the methodology is a matter for the independent commission, and um, obviously they made government aware of, of their, the methodology we're going to use going forward. Um, and I think um, if there's future changes, then it would there may, maybe could be more um, scrutiny of that um, by Parliament, but you know, it's, that would be a matter for Parliament. But sure. I think ultimately, the, the, the Commission are an independent body and it's for them to determine their methodology. OK, thanks. And um, a final point, convener, if I may, would be um, you, you raised the issue, in fact, you, you enlightened us somewhat to the whole process, I think, by saying that the process was meant to have been carried out after the last council elections, because they should have been a year ago, and, and the timetable changed. So therefore, I, I suppose that then begs the question, I mean, maybe answers some of the questions of why this all seems to have been done in such a rush, and given political parties, etc., difficulties in, in getting their elected members in place. So I suppose my question from that now, and given the fact that you mentioned possibility of judicial review, um, if if judicial reviews were to come forward, then that might, might in some way put a, a spanner in the works of the process. It might stop the process. So what I wonder is, um, given the evidence we've taken and some of the issues that have emerged, can this process be halted for the next election? Can it be stopped and can it be picked up again after the election? Um, the orders are laid and um, the, the, the new boundaries are in place. 
Um, it's clearly for so, a matter for any council if they choose to spend um, public uh, money um, on, on a judicial review. That would be a matter for those councils. So the answer is no, it will go ahead. These will be the boundaries oh, they, and they, nothing they, can stop they it. Are, they are the boundaries. That, that has happened. That, mm. that's the, the, the Thank you for clarifying that for us. Okay. Can I maybe just ask a little bit more about the methodology? And Minister, I know you'll say that that's set independently uh, by the Boundary Commission. Uh, local Government Boundary Commission um, and that statute would have to change for them to then amend that methodology to take into account the kind of things that Parliament and others may wish to... So, so see, you mentioned, right, okay, let, let's go back to the first thing you said then, Minister, because I, I saw your official Mr Peter sh shaking his head in relation to that, right? So you, so, so you said that the methodology is set independently by the Local Government Boundary Commission for Scotland. That, that's the situation. How... Under what, under what criteria do they then choose that methodology? What are the strictures by which they operate to come up with their independently agreed methodology? So the, the, the kind of reason that there's a difference, because in terms of the methodology, that's a matter for the Commission yes. um, as an independent body. But in terms of um, when they draw the boundaries within a council, then clearly they need to do that within the, the statutory rules. And you know, one of the... One of the, the one of the rules is that every ward has to be three or four members, and that's that's a, a concern that's caused okay. issues in, in the island mm -hmm. communities. So that, for instance, that's a, a restriction that, that is placed on them. They cannot, um, as the law stands just now, um, say that in the case of um, Arran, for instance, there should be a one-member ward, um, still by STV, obviously, but a one-member ward for Arran, and um, that is one of the things that we're looking at to see whether the island's bill can, can change. But maybe, do you mm -hmm. want to talk a little bit about um, the, 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 the methodology and the... the, the the rules. Uh, yeah, just, just to add, I think it is important to make the distinction between the statutory criteria that the Commission and indeed ministers have to work to in producing recommendations and then deciding on them and the actual methodology to produce those proposals. At the moment, the statute does not say anything about the precise methodology that the Commission is supposed to use. So if you like, the legislation sets out the ends which are the, the, the criteria that are to be applied, but not the means, that is to say, it doesn't dictate uh, what methodology should be used, or at the moment, uh, neither is there a provision for that methodology actually to be subject to, to ministerial or indeed parliamentary approval. Um, I would just add as well, I mean, the, the Commission were pretty open, they were, I would say, very, very open in terms of describing what their methodology was. We are well aware, of course, that uh, there were a lot of concerns expressed about that methodology. There were some, uh, quite a lot of comments uh, from some stakeholders that they had issues with various aspects of that methodology, although I think it's fair to add that others actually did welcome it, and in particular the use of deprivation. Uh, so I think it's, it's not perhaps about lack of transparency. Uh, I think the, the Commission did explain at some length what the methodology was, but the legislation doesn't dictate that. It is for the Commission to decide what methodology to use in producing the proposals. The legislation dictates how those proposals uh, should look in terms of the, the rules that the Commission operates under. Okay, yeah, let me just explore this a bit further in a second, Elaine, sorry. But I think I understand it now, <laughs> Mr Perry. So uh, what statute does say is that the, the end... <coughs> Which, which the local government boundary commission is is a, is 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 is, is, is um, tasked with arriving at, and they independently set a methodology to meet those ends. But the ends are outlined in statute. So, if anything was to be reviewed, in theory, it would be what statute says what those ends should be. In, in theory, that might impact on how the context by which the methodology is shaped. What I'm trying to get towards, I, I suppose, is you were very clear about. Uh, their hands are tied in terms of statute says it must be a three-member or a four-member ward. So that's pretty clear. You, you, we, we, could, we could easily, there'd be consequence, we could easily say there could be one-member or two-member wards, and, and rather than have a four-member ward... That, that was in, yeah. in the Islands Bill. Right, so but that, that could be rolled out across Scotland. Because that, that, that could be an urban issue as much as it is a, a, a rural issue uh, as well. So, so that, that's clear. Any other influence that, that, that Parliament would have in relation to other factors such as deprivation or parity would be determined by what statute says in terms of what the ends to which the Local Government Boundary Commission for Scotland has to operate at? Well, I, I guess that that will stand for the last time that the Boundary Commission decided to include uh, rural, rurality within as part of the methodology. That's easy for you to say. Um, <laughs> 
Um, so the decision was, was made to, to, to take um, sparsity of population into account as in, in determining um, ward boundaries in the, in the past. And I th uh, you know, so that was something that they, they decided to do. Um, and they've, they've looked at their methodology and decided that, that, that the multiple index of deprivation would be a, another approach, just another factor that they would take into account. Okay. Thank you. I'll quit whilst I'm possibly behind with my line of questioning there, Minister. Um, Elaine Smith had indicated she wanted a supplementary first, Mr Gibson. Thank you. And it was probably for Mr Petty, actually, rather than the Minister, although that's up to the Minister to decide who, who's going to answer, of course. Um, it, it's more about the Act rather than methodology. And so I was just wondering, is it correct that the, the Act requires the Commission to consult with councils on any proposal for a period of two months before that proposal is put to public consultation. And if, if that is a matter of the Act requiring it, um, what are the repercussions then if, if, the, if the Commission doesn't do that, it doesn't consult with the Council? I think, for, first of all, to be clear that we're, from everything I've seen, the Commission has followed their statutory responsibilities in every case on every point. But I'll ask Brian if he wants to answer further. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, basically, that's a, that's a fair summary of what the legislation says, that there is to be uh, consultation with councils and then subsequently consultation more generally, and that is laid out in the, in the statute. And the way the, the Commission approached that, um, although I don't think this is specifically required by statute, is actually to have a two-stage process, so the so the commission can, had separate consultation processes about councillor numbers and about boundaries, but in both cases they applied the statutory rules about consultation. Your, your, your um, opinion is, and having looked at it, that they did they, they did apply those statutory rules. Okay, thanks. Okay, Mr. Gibson. Thank you, uh, Convener. It's about consistency, this question. I mean, when I asked you about East Lothian, you talked about uh, Musselburgh it would be left with a population uh, uh, 16% less or something like that. But, I mean, basically what the Council has said is that creating a single Musselburgh ward abolishes the divide between Musselburgh West and East, but by doing this, the Commission have weakened community ties between several communities in their closest town, and there's also been a knock-on effect which has actually impacted on other wards. But the reason I'm asking that is about consistency is because my constituency, all of my wards have an average of 16% more <coughs> electors than Ruth's um, constituency, both of which make up North Ayrshire. So, so for example, she's got 3,000 uh, 3, electors, slightly less per council, I've got 3,500. And we take in sparsity, which just mentioned, my constituency is 80% of the make up geographically of North Ayrshire, so I don't understand why within one local authority area that would be the case. I, I should, on numbers, have 18 councillors and Ruth 15, when in actual fact we'll have 16 and this constituency will have 17. So surely, in, in, if you're going to be consistent in terms of parity, then within a local authority, then these anomalies shouldn't arise. I, th I think um, there will always be a degree of anomalies, and in fact, if we're talking about providing the Commission with more flexibility, then we actually might be what we're actually in, in fact then seeing is there will be more anomalies. Um, it, it's, there, is, there, is a, there is a balancing balancing act to be had. Um, and, you know, I think the, 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 most, the, the, most, the most significant issue, I think, for North Ayrshire was the, the, the situation of Arden. Um, and you know, hopefully that's something that the, the Islands Bill will, will manage to, to rectify. But that will then mean that that the, the council will have um, more variation in the size of wards. So, as well as having three and four member wards, they would be potentially one and two member wards. So, so sorry, just one, one, one point. Yeah, I'm not really sure why Anne, which is uh, about three and a half percent of the population in North Ayrshire, would change that balance so dramatically for the whole, all the mainland wards. You know, I mean, it's there's, mm -hmm. I've got five. I have five wards in my constituency. Aaron only is in one of them, obviously. So why are all the others underrepresented relative to Cunningham South? I mean, we've got high levels of deprivation, so that's not an issue. We've got more sparsity of population, higher, a bigger geographic area. Um, yeah, the, <laughs> yeah. I, I think there's, a, there's clearly a balancing, a balancing act to be done and in, in, in the main. The um, Commission will try to get to as close to parity as it, it always can. And, um, that's, so, but these changes will have improved parity within um, North Ayrshire Council, as it will have done in, in all the other councils. So the, the proposal, the recommendations from the, the Boundary Commission will have improved parity. Uh, sorry, actually, I've done the reverse of that. Actually, 
they've done the reverse because the, I, you know, the, there was much more balance before this than there was in terms of uh, numbers per councillor. So it's actually, by, the, the three additional councillors have effectively went to uh, Cunningham South. So it's made, it, so it's made the, the, the disparity higher rather than lower that existed prior. I, I, I don't think that they will have looked at the, the parliamentary boundaries as... as, no, as, 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 as I don't mean in a parliamentary divisive. sense. All I'm saying is that every one of the ten wards should, fit, should surely have, in effect, the same number of voters per councillor. That's the only argument I'm trying to make. I mean, particularly given the fact that some of the boundaries originally, which have been retained, were completely out of kilter with local communities anyway. I mean, you've got... You've got You've got parts of Beath, you cross a road and you're, and you're in a ward with Port and Cross, which is a 30, 40 minute drive away. <laughs> a complete nonsense. Um, intimate knowledge of Portland Cross. Of course you have but if, if, you could, if you could maybe say a little bit about that. I mean, it's just about consistency. What I can say is in terms of the representations that, that we received from North Ayrshire, North Ayrshire was one of the, the councils which agreed with deprivation being a, 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 a factor. Um, there was, I think, some concern about the fact that the 10% cap and had maybe not allowed North Ayrshire to increase to the, the extent. Um, and other, other issues were around, um, well, the Commission managed to, re to retain proposals which had the best solution to maintain parity and improve the representation across, across the whole council area. Um, but it did give weight to the council's argument on CCP. Um, when it was making its 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 decisions, um, so it, um, about the the workload um, of of the councillors, um, so it's it's clear that the the commission in making its decisions listened to what the council were saying, what the, the representations they received from the from the public going forward, um, and at, at that stage made made their changes. Okay, can I, can I maybe just, just move on slightly? But I think Mr Gibson's helped illustrate quite an important important point, which is it was, it was making the case for consistency and parity within the local authority area for which he's a constituency <coughs> MSP. But in the earlier evidence session, Councillor Neil was talking about not wanting a one-size-fits-all uh, policy, uh, and there was talk about uh, that artificial 10% rule uh, in relation to changes to achieve parity or otherwise, uh, and, and two local authorities who were very articulate and helpful in our understanding of the situation, but one was delighted with the process because it got the outcome they wanted, and the other one was dissatisfied because they didn't get the outcome they wanted. Does that not just uh, remind us the NVIDIA's decision that any final decision, decision maker has to make, where as long as people get the decision they want, they're happy, and when they don't get the decision one, they're not happy. And I think Mr Gibson was outlining some of the conflicts within that, um, particularly in relation to how Aaron might want better representation, but that might go against the parity argument that Mr Gibson was making. I suppose I put that back on record again because it brings us to we started the evidence session about who the final decision maker should be, uh, how we get a better understanding of that process and where that power should sit. So I suppose as we draw towards the end of this evidence session, I think committee members would welcome some, some additional thoughts that the minister might have in relation to that. Well, as I think I said earlier, I think it's, it's appropriate that we look at our processes and you know, I think to, to see that they are, are fit for purpose going forward. Um, but, but clearly in terms of the fifth review, we have um, the, the rules and, and the, the statute that's in place, and that's what the deliberations and the, what the work of the Commission and, and my determinations um, were made on. Okay, can I just check with the committee members whether there be any further questions? Sorry, just Elaine, yes. Briefly. Yeah, thanks very much, Mr. I mean, just on what Mr. Gibson says, he obviously has um, a great knowledge of his own constituency, and therefore he can put forward some of these cases. We heard evidence, uh, well, we actually had Ian Gray at the committee asking some questions on behalf of his area as well. And I think one of the issues is, is de definitely consistency is a problem. Um, of the areas that you did make changes, I mean, one of those areas was Dundee, which presumably you have a great knowledge of as well on a personal basis. So the bottom line, I think, is about... We have the methodology. We can question some of it, particularly on deprivation, making a late entry, for example. Um, but in terms of consistency, I think uh, the bottom line has to be whether or not this whole area has to be reassessed as to who's making decisions, whether it's better to be 
final political decisions. Who knows about the areas? Is it the independent commission? If it is the independent commission taking evidence, then should they just be left alone to get on with it? And if it is not them, then who actually is best placed to have these local, the local knowledge and the local examples? And Councillor O'Neill earlier actually raised the issue of councillors in some ways perhaps being best placed. So I wonder if you have any final comments to make on this. I, I, I certainly could, could say that um, when councils and councillors, as well as community councillors and members of the community and MSPs um, wrote to the Commission or myself, then I looked at their submissions very seriously. Um, <clears throat> I think there would be, um, just like MSPs do not, are not allowed to set boundaries for Scottish Parliament um, elections, I think it would be the same conflict, I think, if, if, if councillors were setting the boundaries for uh, local council. However, as powers for elections in general come to this parliament, um, I think it's appropriate for us to look to see whether we want to try and bring those systems together. Um, it's, I, I'm certainly keen that, um, where possible, we have the same systems in place for local government as we have in place for Scottish government, and in terms of some of the changes that we're, we're making um, in terms of some of the orders later today. It's about bringing those systems together. But uh, you know, as, as more powers come to this parliament, it is absolutely an appropriate time for us to look, look at how these powers are used and to make sure we have it appropriate, ap appropriate levels of scrutiny. OK. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. Um, I think that, that concludes our, our questioning. But yeah, you are staying with us. Um, but b before, <coughs> I, b before I suspend briefly, can I just put on the record again that uh, we want as many voters to exercise a democratic right to vote at next year's council elections and we are having a round table uh, at our committee next week to help encourage uh, voter turnout and participation and also maybe just to give you the opportunity minister one final time if our committee does decide to look further at how to improve this process including decision making at the end point whether you'd be keen to work in partnership with the committee to, to tease some of that out I, I think I would certainly be happy to, to be part of that process and my officials likewise OK, now, uh, I, I will say goodbye for the moment, momentarily suspending, but I know you are staying with us, so we'll suspend, suspend briefly. Thanks.
Okay, can I, can I welcome everyone back um, to the Local Government Communities Committee Agenda Item 3. We now move on to subordinate legislation. Uh, the committee will be taking evidence on the draft representation of the people postal voting for Local Government Elections Scotland Amendment Regulations 2016. And can I welcome back Joe Fitzpatrick, Minister for Parliamentary Business. And I also welcome Louise Scott, Elections Policy Advisor, and Roddy Angus, Elections Policy Advisor, Scottish Government. The instrument is laid under affirmative procedure, which means the Parliament must approve it before the provisions can come into force. Following this evidence session, the committee will be invited at the next agenda item to consider a motion to approve the, in the instrument. Now, in inviting the Minister to make a short opening uh, statement, I understand you'll be speaking to not just this particular statutory instrument, but also another one we're going to dispose of uh, later on in the agenda. So just put that on the record for for the purpose of anyone watching, uh, Minister. OK, th uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to set out uh, the Government's position on, in, on the orders before you today. Um, I think it's generally um, acknowledged that the May 2012 Scottish Local Government elections were well run, and that's why we are only making relatively minor changes to the rules which will be used for next May's elections. The main rules for Scottish Local Government elections are set out in the Scottish Local Government Election Order 2011 and the representation of the people postal voting for Local Government Elections Scotland Regulations 2009 and these orders only make minor changes to those rules. However, we've made a number of amendments. These are mainly to reflect wider electoral changes, most of which um, also were made uh, for this year's Scottish Parliament elections, such as a deadline of 5pm on the day of poll for the issue of replacement or lost lost or not received postal ballot papers or allowing postal ballot packs to be issued earlier and the requirement um, of the returning officer to record on a list the reasons why a postal voting statement was rejected. We have also made a number of technical changes which allow for more information to be provided to voters in polling stations um, on how to complete their ballot paper. So given that it, we use STV in local government elections, that feels appropriate and all of these changes are detailed in the policy notes that accompany the orders. Um, I'd like, however, to highlight one, I think, significant improvement which we um, have made. We've changed the definition of personal expenses so that a candidate's disability should not affect the amount they can spend on campaigning. Um, some of the disabilities can result in candidates having to incur extra expenditure, such as needing um, to use taxis instead of public transport or requiring a sign language interpreter. And this change will mean that any costs that are directly attributed to a candidate's disability will no longer count towards their election expense limits. Um, at this point, I'd also like to pay tribute to the work of the One in Five campaign, which is a cross-party group campaigning to encourage the empowerment and increase political participation amongst the stable people in Scotland. Without the input of the One in Five campaign, I don't think these um, amendments would necessarily be coming forward, so I, I thank them for, for their help in, in that. Um, and although this order, it doesn't part, form part of this order, I'd also like to mention the launch of the Access to Elections Office Fund. So that's a fund which operates, is operated by Inclusion Scotland. It will provide grants to individuals who are standing for election as candidates in their local area, um, uh, assisting them in any additional costs that they, they have due to a disability. Uh, Scottish Government has provided Inclusion Scotland with funding to operate and manage the scheme as well as to cover grant payments to individuals whilst wishing to stand for election um, and I'm pleased to say the fund is going very well um, with Inclusion Scotland having over 25 expressions of interest in the scheme from all parts of the country. Um, Inclusion Scotland are now working with these individuals to take forward their applications which um, will be decided upon by an independent access to elected office funds decision panel made up predominantly of disabled people and including expertise about reasonable adjustments and overcoming of physical, social and cultural bar barriers facing disabled people. Um, that panel will include uh, disabled former MSPs, um, Dennis Robertson and Siobhan McMahon. Um, in future, uh, the important thing is that in future, any additional costs which are directly attributed to a candidate's disability will not count towards their election expense limits. And I think that's only right that everyone should have the same opportunity to be elected as a local councillor and that any extra costs directly attributed to a disability should not be counted. Um, so I hope, hope you'll agree that that these, order, these orders set out sensible rules for the running of local government elections next May and happy to answer any questions you have. Um, 
Give me OK, thank you very much, Minister. Um, any questions from members? Go ahead. Yes. Thanks, convener. Um, and I'm not sure it directly relates to the orders, but given that the minister went a bit beyond that as well, I wonder if he might wish to make a comment. I can understand if he doesn't. But it's on the... We do have a, um, a mention of proxy voting in the policy note. And in terms of people with uh, disabilities, temporary disabilities can often mean that someone's applying for a proxy vote at, a, at a quite a late stage because they maybe haven't had a postal vote and therefore they want someone to, to vote for them. They don't want to be disenfranchised. And what I wondered was if the minister has any comment on um, the fact that, that somebody medical maybe has to sign these. And so would we expect that a, a GP, for example, would sign such a form and not be charging for it because, you know, someone has a temporary disability, maybe an infection in a wound or something like that, that, that stops them getting to a polling station. It, it seems to me that the fact that maybe GPs are charging like they would do for a passport is, is something that can disenfranchise or refusing actually to sign the, the, the forum. You know, I think this could be part of disenfranchising people. We would normally expect people that are making use of the emergency proxy system to probably actually be in, hos in hospital more so than those that are housebound for a particular reason. There is nothing in the legislation that actually says whether or not a GP should, can charge for the signature. I'm afraid I don't know if it's set out in, in any of the health code regulations or not. Well, it's, it's maybe something that the committee might want to take further consideration of at some point. Yeah. We will look at that, but am I right in saying that an emergency postal vote would still be available to somebody in that situation? An emergency proxy, not no, but an emergency. Well, the postal vote, they would have to know not well in so advance. Let, let, let us, as time. you say, it's not part of this order, but let us take away that thing. I mean, I think that's part of the process we always need to look. The aim here is to make sure that the maximum number of people are um, able to exercise their vote. So if there's any little... little um, areas that we can improve that, then we should look at that. Obviously, we would, we'd need to consult with um, stakeholders in, in, up and down across the councils, but um, we'll, we'll look at the point you're making. Thank you. I think that'd be very helpful. Thank, thank you, Lane. Any other questions? OK, there have been no other questions. We now move to agenda item four, uh, which to formally consider the statute as we've just been uh, talking about and, um, and in calling for a to recommend approval of the draft representation of the people postal voting for the local government election Scotland Amendments Regulations 2016. Um, we now enter um, a, a, a formal uh, debate. Um, I'm just checking to get the process, process right here, Minister. Yeah. yeah. So we uh, uh, just, just just for accuracy, there's now the opportunity for debate. Should members wish, would anyone like to contribute to debates in relation to this? Thank you. Um, can I just ask you to move motion S5M1514, Minister? Moved. Thank you. And, yep, thank you. The, the question is that motion S5M1514, in the name of the Minister for Parliamentary Business, is approved. Can I ask if we're agreed? agreed. We are agreed. Thank you for your patience there. And we now move to agenda item five, which I'm just going to note because I said at agenda item three we would we would look at stat the uh, we would have a statement from the minister in relation to and I'll just put it on the record evidence in draft Scottish Low Government Elections Amendment Number Two Order 2016 and we've done that and we've afforded members the opportunity to ask questions if they wish so I will now move to agenda item six uh, which is formal consideration of S5M1515 calling for the committee to recommend approval of the draft Scottish Local Government Elections Amendments Number Two Order 2016. Again, members are afforded the opportunity to enter into debate at this point. Can I just check for the record whether any members wish to participate in a debate? Okay. Uh, that not been the case, can I ask the Minister to move motion S5M1515? Moved. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, okay, the question then is that motion S S5M1515, in the name of the Minister for Parliamentary Business, be uh, approved. Are we all agreed? OK, thank you very much. Uh, the committee will report on the outcome of this instrument and the previous instrument in, in due course. And at that stage, uh, can I thank the Minister and officials for giving evidence? Thank you. Thank you. OK, the committee will now move on 
to agenda item 7, which is to consider a number of negative instruments, uh, which are the representation of the people variation of limit of candidates local government election expenses Scotland amendment number 2, regulations 2016, SSI 2016 forward slash 263, and representation of the people absent voting at local government election Scotland amendment number 2, regulations 2016 SSI 2016 forward slash 264. Just about got there. These instruments are laid under the negative procedure, which means that their provisions will come into force unless the Parliament votes on a motion to annul the instruments. Parliament will note that the DPLR committee considered that it did not need to draw the attention of the Parliament to the instruments on any grounds within its remit and put on record that no motions to annul have been laid and can invite members to make any comments on either of those instruments. Okay, there have been no comments. Can I invite the committee to agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to these instruments? Are we agreed? Okay, excellent. Now, at least private session now. Okay, and as previously agreed, we now move into private session. Thank you.